for the last month or so. And in it, you know that we've been trying to pause and take enough time to really begin to understand um, what's so important about the cross. To get past cliche answers that very often nobody understands. Um, Why it is that, if you will, the cross saves us. How exactly does that work? Well, to do that, we've been using the author in your New Testament who wrote the second most amount of material and maybe one of the most overlooked writers in the Bible by the name of John, and specifically the Gospel or the history of Jesus that he wrote. There's a lot of things to like about John. I don't mind telling you that I am a uh, huge fan of John and what he wrote. One of the things is that oftentimes people will talk about the Gospel of John being the simplest of the four Gospels. And you can give it to somebody who's eight years old. And if they read it, you'll understand what John is saying. Um, That's true. And then the next time you read it, you see things that you didn't see the, the first time around. Then the fifth time you read it, you see things you didn't see the fourth time you read it. And after you've read it 20 or 25 times, all of a sudden you're seeing things that you didn't see the first time or the third time or the tenth time around. He, of all the New Testament writers, has an eye for detail. He has an eye for beauty. He would be a great novelist if he chose not to be a disciple of Jesus, be a fisherman, and whatnot. And you've maybe seen that, actually, over the course of the series with the way that he has different images or themes recur throughout his gospel or build throughout his gospel or the way that he uses irony. You're going to get that sense one more time tonight when we ask him one more time to tell us why the cross matters so much. How it changes everything and how it actually saves us. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 1. This marks a big shift in the plot of the Gospel of John. John, chapter 13, through John, chapter 17, marks the last evening of Jesus' life, what we call Monday, Thursday. And John will give us lots of information about that evening that nobody else in the Bible does. And then John 18 and 19 are the crucifixion of Jesus. Well, at that turn... As Jesus and John begin to talk about Jesus last night on earth with his disciples, John says this in the first verse of that chapter. Now just before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go back to the Father. Having loved his own, his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Uh, For those of you who have been here for any of the weeks of this series prior to now, you actually see in that verse a couple of the things that we've already talked about. The first week we talked about Passover, that John sees Jesus as Passover for us who believe in him. You see that there. You know that, that, uh, that phrase, his hour, has to do with Jesus' glory. And that all throughout the Gospel of John, it's not here yet. It's not here yet. The hour has not come yet until you get to here. And in Jesus' crucifixion, all of a sudden, God's very glory is seen in a way that it never has been prior or since, according to John. But, this is the part of the verse I want you to pay attention to. Having loved his own who were in the world... He loved them to the very end. It's a sentence that, however powerful it may be, you could think that you might forget two or three chapters later. That is not the way that John intends it to be. That phrase right there, he loved them to the very end, you would render that word end in ancient Greek, telos. And the word itself is the word tell, T-E-L. In English, you spell the word end, E-N-D. In ancient Greek, you spell the word end, T-E-L. So if your workday had ended, you would say tell. 
You can make tell into anything, a noun, an adjective, a verb, whatever, by adding things to the end or the beginning. But the word itself is tell. Jesus says he was going to love his own to the very end, to the telos. Flash forward now to the crucifixion scenes in the Gospel of John, John 18 and 19. Lots of information that John gives us about the crucifixion of Jesus that none of the other Gospels do. You only get it in John. This is one of those moments. Only John records this moment. And for good reason, by the way, as you'll see. To, of all the four Gospelists, what Jesus said here is going to have the most significance to John. When Jesus after all that he had been through, being tried, being tortured, being crucified. He reaches the very end of that brutal process. And after they had given him the vinegar because he was thirsty, thirsty, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He died. These are the very last words of Jesus. I want you to pay attention to that phrase right there. It is finished. In and of themselves, in fact, you and I probably, if you've been in church at all, you've probably heard somebody talk about that phrase from the cross, it is finished, and what it means, and how powerful, and how rich and deep that phrase can be, and all that it entails. Well, let me show you exactly what John wants you to get from that last word on the cross. It is precisely what Jesus wanted to infer. This is that word in Greek. It is finished. To telestai in ancient Greek. The TE on the front are just an add-on. The STI on the end are just an add-on. The word is tell. T-E-L. Which should ring a bell for you if you were listening five minutes ago. So really, if you wanted to say that the way that, that uh, Jesus meant it to be heard, and the way it has to be read in the Gospel of John, what Jesus did is spread out his arms and he said, as he died, it has ended. I have reached my end. What end? The end to which I said I would love my followers. In John 13, 1. It has ended. This is my end. Jesus said that he would love his followers to the very end. What end is that? John makes it abundantly clear. To the very last breath of Jesus' life. You need to imagine what this tells you about the process of Jesus' death over the last hours of his life. You have to think of it in terms of an end being in sight. So, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's arrested and he's put on trial before the chief priest and then before Herod and then before Pilate, in Jesus' mind, what he sees is a finish line that he has not reached yet. He's beaten and he's bloodied and his head is marked by a crown of thorns. And in Jesus' mind, what he sees is a finish line that he has not reached yet. He's asked to carry the cross all the way out of the city to a shallow hill called Golgotha. And in Jesus' mind, what he sees is a finish line he hasn't reached yet. And then they nail him to a cross, and there he hangs, naked and ashamed. Everyone laughing at him and jeering at him thinking he's the biggest joke in the world. This man says he's the king of the Jews. What a fool. And in Jesus' mind, he sees a finish line that he hasn't reached yet. One of the two criminals who are crucified with him reaches out to Jesus and says, would you please remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus says to him, you will be with me this day in paradise. And Jesus, when having that interaction, sees a finish line in his mind that he has not reached yet. And it is only after all of that 
every step along the way, every agonizing step along the way, as his breaths grew more shallow, as his body grew more racked with pain, it is only at the very end when he could not breathe anymore, when he was done, that he could say to Telestai, I have reached the end. And I promised that I would love you to the end. Here we are. You have to imagine what would have happened to his followers, even us 2,000 years later, if he had not done that. If he had not loved us to the very end. Um, how would that have changed things? Well, his disciples then, if he had given up, maybe before Pilate or Herod, and Jesus had said, you know what, that's it. I can't do this. Um, I, I give up. I'll do it your way. I'll stop being such a uh, troublemaker. I'm done. Well, the movement that you and I know as Christianity never gets born if Jesus gives up. His followers then, as well as now, question his resolve, his commitment to see this through to the very end. It doesn't work. You wonder if Jesus really is as patient and merciful as He said He was, or we saw Him be during the course of His life. If He gave up early, you'd never know. If He gave up early, he'd, you'd never have heard Him said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is only because we see Him hear that that we know that we, in our worst moments, in the moments of our greatest pain, can forgive those who hurt us too. It is only when you see Jesus interact mercifully with that criminal who cried out to Him on the cross that you know there is no end to Jesus' mercy. And even Jesus' own pain does not assuage that or change it. And if Jesus hasn't gone all the way to the end, to his very last breath, the death rattle. If he had not done that, then death would have won. What we're about to celebrate four days from now wouldn't make any difference. Because Jesus would not have stared death in the face and traveled through the dark all the way to Easter Sunday. If Jesus had not loved us to the very end, what Jesus means to us, what the cross means to us, the Christian faith itself, doesn't exist. It doesn't work. That's what John sees when he sees a cross. He sees a finish line. He sees an end. To which Jesus was so committed that he would see it through. But that's not enough. In the Gospel of John, any discussion about this particular topic is incomplete if you don't reference something that Jesus said twice on his last night with his disciples in that upper room. This is the second time he says it. He says to his followers that evening, 24 hours or less before his own death, this is my commandment, that you love one another. As I have loved you. No greater love, there is no greater love than this, that he would lay down his life for his friend. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. See, according to the Gospel of John, and this is very intentional on his part, and what he records out of Jesus' teaching, any discussion of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Week, the crucifixion of Jesus, it is incomplete unless it moves you to think about how much you are willing to love. Because this is how Jesus in the Gospel of John said it. As I have loved you, and now you know how far he did, that's how I want you to love each other. Jesus loved us to the very end. End. He was committed to it. 
he screwed up his courage and walked that terrible walk to the very end. And he says to his disciples, on the same evening that that process would begin, I need you to love each other the same way that I'm about to love you. Will you do that? Because if you do, you'll find out it's the only thing that really matters. St. Augustine of old was fond of saying to all those who went to his churches, you know what, just love and then do what you want. Because love matters most of all. So you have to think about the upshot of the crucifixion because that's what Jesus would want you to do in John 15. You have to think about the impact on you. Frankly, Good Friday is incomplete without it. We praise this Jesus who loved us to the end, but oftentimes we don't think about how that is the model or example for how we are supposed to love one another. What's the furthest extent to which you have loved somebody in the last year? Um, You probably would say with me there are a lot of incomplete notions about that, right? Um, Maybe you have felt fondly about somebody in the last year. You have felt a kinship with them. Okay? That's not nothing, but that's not loving somebody to the end. Uh, Maybe you have spent some time with somebody and developed a friendship with somebody. Maybe you've had fun with somebody. That's not bad either, um, but that is not loving somebody to the end. Jesus says the way that you know you're a follower of his is that you love the way that he did. And he loved all the way to the end. How much has your love of other people in the last year cost you? How much have you given of yourself? A little? A lot? This is the way that Christians have to think about love because Jesus loved us to the end. And he said we need to do the same. He said that no greater love has any person than this, that you lay down your life for a friend. I wonder who our friends really are. Maybe you, like me, would be able to give a list of the people that you consider your friends. They're the people you hang out with, the people you share a hobby with, um, the people that you do things with, maybe the people in your small group. This is what you consider friendship, and these are not bad things. But I think according to Jesus, those aren't your friends. You know who your friends are? The ones you're willing to love the way that he loved us. The ones that you will sacrifice for. The ones that you will suffer for. The ones where you will be discomforted for their sake. This is what friendship is supposed to look like. This is what Christian love is supposed to look like. Jesus loved us to the end. And he told his disciples, don't you ever forget it. You're supposed to love each other the same way. And any Good Friday is incomplete, at least in John's eyes, without us considering that. As you think about the cross being the place where Jesus loved us to the end and then pointed to it as the way for us to follow. Why don't you consider this video about the last sounds of Jesus' life? Or as it will say, what love sounds like. And then we'll observe communion together.
Ah! <sighs> 